Um, we now move on to questions to the Minister for Health, Social Services and Public Safety, and I call Mr Roy Beggs. Mr Beggs. Question number one. Minister. Uh, my department has faced considerable financial challenges in 2014-15, with some £160 million of additional resources estimated to be required in order to balance the books. Some of these have been addressed to the £80 million additional funding which we received at the Executive on Thursday, but there are some £70 million uh, remains to be managed. The situation does not get any better in 2015-16, with additional pressures within the health and social care system of over £300 million, on top of those pressures carried forward from 2014-15, and those will be dealt with through non-recurrent measures. The largest inescapable pressure within this is an additional uh, is additional pension costs estimated to be in the region of £90 million. These, there are also substantial pressures in 15-16 in relation to demographic changes, nice drugs, elective care, mental health and learning disability resettlements. For Recently at the Health Committee officials uh, revealed to me that the trusts were in schedule for a deficit of some £130 million but they have recently been awarded £60 million by in your monitoring. Would the Minister accept that when pressures first emerged this time last year and were not addressed by the annual budget process, that difficulties were mounting up in terms of inefficiencies and growing waiting lists? And now we, we also understand there's been an increased number of, the, uh, number of elected operations that have also been cancelled because of staff shortages. We accept that there are major problems resulting in the failure to manage the finances of the health service. The, the members correct the current reported deficits for 14-15 amount to 133.3 million pounds. And clearly, some of the 60 million and the 20 million will have to be used to address those issues. Also, the trusts have been told in no uncertain terms that they must balance the books for this year. That's going to be extremely challenging. Could I say that I regularly in my previous capacity met the, the, either the chairs or the chief executives of the trusts? In the first three years, they were somewhat relaxed about their budgetary situation and said whilst it was challenging, they were going to meet their targets. This year, they're telling me it is extremely difficult. And the reason for that is not inefficiencies as such. It's this radical change in demand that we first saw coming into the system in autumn 2013. That has remained the situation that we are getting more and more demand, and yet our, our, our bottom line in terms of an increase in budget is only 2 per cent. And that is the pressure that is beginning to tell. But very efficiently well managed trusts are telling me they are finding it very hard to manage, then I believe it is not inefficiencies, it is simply the sheer number of people presenting themselves for treatment. Mr. Pat Sheehan. I thank the Minister for his question so far. And I wonder, given the pressures that the Minister has outlined there, can he give a, a, a rationale for the increasing costs in the uh, administration of the Health and Care Board? Well, first of all, the, the Health Committee, when I was chair, did look at this specific issue of administrative costs within the health and social care system in Northern Ireland. And the figure they came up with was 4.1% on a £4.65 billion budget. That actually compares very well with other health authorities in the rest of the United Kingdom and indeed internationally. And any, any organisation that is administering such a large amount of money, if it can keep its admin costs down to that level, is relatively efficient. But even if we were to take a percentage point out of that, which would mean a radical downscaling in terms of admin staff, that would not actually come anywhere near what we need to achieve to balance the books for this year. There are radical changes ongoing in the health service, for instance, the Transforming Your Care initiative. That requires highly qualified administrators to, in order to carry out that change. So whilst we are dedicated in this incoming year to look at admin charges, I don't think that that's the silver bullet. It's quite clear the problem here. The problem is increased demand. Six percent, uh, as far as the clinical aspects are concerned, I met the ambulance service on a uh, Friday in Limavari, and their stats would show a 5% a increase in demand for their services. So that there is no great science involved here. The difficulty is that as society ages and we become more infirm, demand rises, and the result is a huge pressure on budgets. So I, I don't believe in inefficiency. I believe it's simply the fact of demand. 
Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? But isn't it true, Mr. Minister, that it isn't just a man giving your predecessors acknowledged waste within the health service? The fact that the health service spent £50 million pounds in the last two years on bank staff, a significant proportion of that not going to frontline services, tens of thousands of cancelled appointments every year. Uh, the board swole its own staff by 25 per cent and more in the last two years. And in that context, then, what action is he taking to audit across the department, the board, the trusts, uh, to ensure that existing budgets are providing best value for money and best outcomes for patients? The Honourable Member for South Belfast is correct. We must always look for value for money in the expenditure of such a huge budget. And as my predecessor said uh, just before he left office, is every penny being spent absolutely correctly? No, there will always be opportunities for savings. But remember, he in his first three years of the CSR took £490 million in savings out of the system and transferred it to frontline care and, more important, matters within the budget. This year we have placed ourselves to £170 million worth of efficiencies. And that has caused each trust to examine, and the board, to examine every aspect of expenditure. Now, there certainly are more efficiencies to be made, but I don't believe that that will solve our difficulty. And I am absolutely convinced that it's the sheer numbers coming through the clinics, the GP surgeries, and the hospitals that are causing our problem. And the stats show that. that. It doesn't take a genius to work out if demand continues to rise at GPs, and they've confirmed that at clinics and hospitals, more out of ours demand that we will inevitably require more money to do it. There's only so much in the way of efficiency you can achieve before you're going to end up needing more money. And more money sounds dramatic, but it's, it's only something like 2.2 per cent of the entire budget we're looking at extra resources. It's not a huge amount in the overall scheme of things, but it seems a large quantum because you're dealing with health, which obviously is the biggest expending department in the whole of the Northern Ireland Executive. We're calling the next member. Can I appeal to members, please, to brief on their questions because long questions generate long answers and fewer members have an opportunity to have their questions answered. Can I go on to Mr. Mickey Brady? Chester Everett, question to Over the past decade, we have witnessed significant progress in cancer provision in Northern Ireland, which has led to real improvements in outcomes for patients across a wide range of cancers. A recent European-wide study shows that Northern Ireland cancer survival rates for lung, breast and prostate are the best in the UK. These improvements have been brought about through investment in cancer services and by a major refocusing of how the service is delivered. We have established cancer targets, instigated extensive reforms and invested in the staff and infrastructure necessary to bring our cancer services up to the standard expected of a modern high quality health service. We have also been able to provide better access to a wide range of evidence-based treatments, including drugs and radiotherapy. The improvements have been impressive, but we must not be complacent. They have all been achieved against a background of increasing demand. Since 2009-2010, the number of patients receiving treatment for cancer after an urgent referral has increased by 42.3%, which again emphasizes the point I made earlier. And with an aging population, this is likely to increase. It is predicted by the age of 75, one in three of us in Northern Ireland will have cancer. Mr Brady, for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, Minister, on a recent Spotlight programme, consultants appeared and raised concerns around the research around cancer. How does the Minister respond to these concerns? I, I watched that programme twice on the iPlayer, just to make certain it picked it up right. I also met Mr. Alistair Murphy, who was one of the main very articulate spokesmen on behalf of cancer sufferers. Uh, I met him in my office here at Stormont. Uh, and there are some very uh, strong points have been made. But as he knows, we have already, before that program was made, instigated the IFR review process. We're looking at the whole individual funding request mechanism and to see is the exceptionality test fit for purpose in the present situation. That's due to report to me at the end of November. So that's how urgently we take this. And I think that is the best vehicle at the moment to deal with that rather than instigating other measures. I don't know what that report's going to say, but it might deal with many of the issues that, that he has raised. But remember, we as a society have increased our spending on, on drugs by 30 million pounds. And a large percentage of that has been on cancer drugs. And the outcomes would indicate that we're doing very well. And most importantly, 
For the first time ever in Northern Ireland's history, there are now more people living with cancer for five years after diagnosis than have passed away. It is moving from being a very life-threatening condition to a long-term condition. Now, there are still many people out there who, of course, have had the trauma of a very bad news indeed. But the movements are in the right direction. I would congratulate the staff of the Belfast City, Can City uh, Cancer it's Hospital Cancer Centre and all the clinicians that have done so much to take us to the forefront on these issues. We can do better, but I think this is a good news story. When I was young, which is a very, very long time ago, as you know, Mr. Brady, 82% um, of those who were, had leukemia at childhood passed away. Now 82% are alive after five years. We have made real major changes, and investment in cancer services over the last 10 years has been considerable, including, of course, the opening of the new cancer centre, where we, we actually invested 17, 70 million pounds. This is two minutes. Is <laughs> Well, Mr. Robison. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister, will the new cancer unit adopt the Galvin Hospital relieve some of the cancer service pressures in Northern Ireland? Well, I am sure he, like even the chair of the Health Committee, I think had a small smile on her face when I announced this morning that the cancer radiotherapy unit at Alton Galvin in Londonderry will open on time in 2016. I know that's great benefit to his constituents in Limavady and other areas. That not only is good news for the North West, that is good news for Northern Ireland, because by 2015, the city, city hospital cancer unit will be at full capacity. So therefore, Northern Ireland PLC, as it were, will not have sufficient spaces. It's also good news for the people of the Irish Republic because cancer sufferers from places like Donegal and Sligo and Leitrim will no longer be forced to go the whole way to Dublin. They can go to help the Galvin for their, for, for their treatment. And this is, I think, a good example of the Irish Republic and Northern Ireland working together on an issue of common concern and shows that it's not a one-way process, that they are, the Irish Republic are sending patients to us and we are sending patients to them in places like Crumlin and Our Ladies. So I welcome this and it's full steam ahead. And I suppose, to be honest, I couldn't go back to London Day having not made this uh, particular announcement because I think I'd be hounded out of the city. So when I do go back this week, I think I'm going, I think it'll be a very welcome process and I really look forward. I hope I'm still in office when it comes to cutting the ribbon for this wonderful facility. Yeah. Well, Mr. Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers and welcome him to his first question time. Um, uh, could I ask the Minister, in, in light of what has been said, what his uh, assessment is, in, both in economic and health terms, uh, of formally establishing a cancer centre of excellence here in Northern Ireland? Well, as I indicated earlier, uh, the, the outstanding work uh, at our centre in Belfast City Hospital has led to huge changes in survival rates. Uh, I'm glad he didn't ask me to answer in Irish, because the only Irish I have is Board Mona, so therefore I'll answer entirely in English. But what I would say is that we, we have achieved so much already in, on, uh, using the resources that we have. We have managed to attract from throughout the world some of the, the top consultants and experts in this field. We have University uh, at Queen's, which is a world leader in research and development in this field. We've got some top uh, PhD students doing tremendous work. So therefore, I believe where we are at the moment, whilst it's not perfect, is a long way from where we were before we opened the centre and we're making progress. But still, we have to be cognizant of the fact that people do get terribly bad news. And therefore, it's not all plain sailing. Some people, unfortunately, have to face the ultimate reality. But could I pay tribute to the four members of this House who have contracted cancer and have had the courage to go public and tell of their journey. People like Jimmy Spratt, people like Paula Bradley, people like Oliver McMullen from East Antrim, and who have come forward, and Sean Rogers, and who have explained their, their journey and shown that there is hope. And I hope we can all give them another 30-year contract and review their situation at the yeah. end of that, and they'll be with us for many years. Mr. Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for that. And could I also 
congratulate him and welcome to the, the Minister for Health. Uh, could I ask the Minister if there are any indications from statistics that shows that there is a higher incidence of cancer uh, in any parts of, of Northern Ireland than other parts? I, I know that uh, Emily McCarthy and several others who represent East Down have indicated their concern about the presence of Sellafield and clusters of cancer which they believe have arisen from that installation. I have to say that the statistics don't really bear that out. The MP for South Down, Mrs Ritchie, and her predecessor, the late Eddie McGrady, also have asked parliamentary questions about that. And they would seem to show that the incidence seems to be no different from other parts of the United Kingdom or the rest of Northern Ireland and relate to other factors such as lifestyle choices, smoking, etc., being the main determinant of cancer. We watch these statistics with, with extreme interest, but as things stand at the moment, we could not be definitive in that respect. Of course, there is the underlying geology of places like South Down and Radiant Gas, which has a problem, but that's well known. But man made inferences, we don't yet know. But the truth is, the quick hit, the low hanging fruit in Northern Ireland to stop cancer, and in many cases, is to stop smoking. We lose about 800 people a year in Northern Ireland to lung cancer. 85 to 90 per cent of those people are smokers, and many of the rest were exposed to passive smoking. That's how we save lives. That could be done at minimal expense. And I recently had a friend who died from lung cancer in Downpatrick. And when you saw what that lady went through in the last six months of her life, and the fact that she admitted that her heavy smoking had caused that terrible illness, we need to concentrate on that rather than the studies which are, frankly, not showing a positive or negative correlation either way. Mr. Leslie Cree for a question. Question three, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, since 2011, the Ulster Hospital has increased in emergency department attendances and emergency admissions. Again, confirming my earlier point. The South Eastern Trust has advised that admission rates in the current year to date represent a 2.7% increase on the same period for 13-14. There has been an improvement in the trust performance against the 12-hour emergency department target for 2013-14, with 1,092 patients waiting longer than 12 hours, which is almost half the equivalent number for 2012-13. Performance against the 4-hour target fell slightly to 70.5% compared to the 73.1% 70 for 12-13. It is unacceptable to me that anyone should have to wait on duly at NE. Uh, whilst 12-hour waits have not yet been eliminated, there is evidence that progress is being made. The number of 12-hour waits has reduced significantly, with only 46 people waiting longer than 12 hours in the first months of this current year, that's 14-15. The percentage seen within four hours has also improved with an average of 76% in the first four months of 14-15. I'm looking to the Health and Social Care Board working for the Trust to ensure progress in delivery against these agreed standards continues. And I would congratulate and thank the staff in uh, the Ulster Hospital for tackling this issue and making solid progress. Well, Mr Cree for supplementary. Thank you again, Deputy Speaker, and uh, I thank the Minister for that information. It's very helpful. Minister, I wonder could you tell us how many, um, approximately how many serious incidents there have been, these adverse incidents are referred to in the Ulster Hospital over the last number of years, and can you, Minister, give us a commitment that when you get assembly-written questions on this matter, that we get a prompt reply rather than the department stalling and uh, thinking up reasons to prevent us from answering those questions quickly? I am aware of concerns expressed by the member and others representing Stagford and North Down that SIIs are collected by trust level and not by individual hospital. I, I, and I can understand, I noticed that there's a written question before me at the moment. I, I've turned that round immediately, uh, that question. Uh, it has ruined several Saturday nights for me, uh, having to do this, these questions from him and many others. Uh, and I can understand uh, where the problem arises. But the difficulty is that if there's fewer than five serious adverse incidents, you are run the risk of revealing the identity of the personal circumstances of the individuals concerned. But I must say, I, was, I thought he raised a very valid point, and I'm going to go back to officials, because doing it for the South East Trust would indicate it could be in Down, Lagan Valley, or the Ulster Hospital, and that's not the level of information that he's expecting. Uh, but that seems to be the reason why he's not getting the specific information he requires. But I'm going to have a look at that, because I think he's made a very valid point. 
Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank our new minister for his very intensive answers today. Can the minister give us an update on the ongoing capital scheme at the Ulster Hospital, which will, I un understand, include a new a and unit? I know that the Honourable Member for North Down has lobbied my predecessor very heavily on this particular issue, and he's very much a, a defender of uh, the Ulster Hospital, and I have no doubt that will continue. Could I say that work on the first phase of the latest redevelopment programme is ongoing and will provide a new 115 generic ward block at the Ulster Hospital? This new ward block is due to be completed in late 2016 and open to patients in early 2017. We'll make certain he gets an invite to that, to that opening. It will provide 288 beds comprising 12 inpatient uh, generic wards, surgical and medical, each with 24 ensuite bedrooms. There will also be day surgery, uh, endoscopy, and four day surgery and three day endoscopy theatres, pharmacy and support services. The second phase of the redevelopment programme will see the construction of a new £108 million acute services block. Enabling works will start uh, started in August 2014, with construction due at the start of on site in the autumn 2015 and scheduled to open to patients in early 2018. The new acute services block will provide 150 beds, including acute observation assessment beds, acute assessment unit, acute wards, emergency department, imaging, new emergency parking, and kitchen, dining, and support services. So I hope, uh, Mr. Dunn, that indicates a huge commitment by the department to the people of North Down and Strangford. And despite very difficult financial circumstances, the capital budget has ensured that the people of North Down and Strangford are very well catered for at the Ulster Hospital. Mr. Sean Roger. Minister, could I welcome you as a South Down colleague to the, your first uh, question time? Um, Minister, in terms of the, the pressures on services at the Ulster Hospital, do you, do you believe that enhanced services, GP services, and opening more beds at Down Hospital would help to alleviate some of those pressures? Well, the Honourable Member for South Down has sat with me, wearing my other hat, in many meetings about this issue, and he's aware the problem at Down Hospital is not one of resources. The problem is attracting middle-grade doctors to staff the hospital at, 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 at particular times. That all attempts by the South East Trust Personnel Department to get experienced doctors to apply and to work at Down have been largely unsuccessful. And I personally am convinced that the information I'm getting from the Chief Executive of the South East Trust on this is correct. I've been shown just how few people are applying. Now, I know I got myself into very serious trouble by saying this to a packed public meeting in St. Patrick's Grammar School uh, about a year ago, but I am still convinced that in the absence of middle-grade doctors, we cannot continue to treat patients. Technically, it's illegal. We can't do it. So therefore, until we solve that problem, we're going to have to divert patients to the Ulster Hospital with all the difficulties that does ca cause. But it is not a lack of will by the board or by this department to ensure that those staff are attracted. Mr. Jonathan Cray. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four. ICPs work as a multi-sector collaborative network of health and social care providers that come together to respond innovatively to the assessment care needs of local communities. The initial focus of the 17 integrated care partnerships, which were established in September 2013, is on the fairly elderly and aspects of long-term conditions, namely diabetes, stroke care and respiratory conditions. ICPs have been engaged in reviewing care pathways in their respective local areas and have identified opportunities to enhance service provision for citizens of Northern Ireland. Examples include provision of special information to GPs on care for patients with long-term conditions, increasing provision of structured education programs for patients with type 2 diabetes, development of an integrated role for the third sector, organisations in supporting older people in the community, and collaboration with the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service on their approach to handling emergency calls concerning uh, diabetic Cases. I welcome the contribution of all the health and social care providers who are participating in this work to improve the integration of care for patients and service users. Big for supplement. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that uh, comprehensive answer and wish him all the best in his new job. And, uh, Hope he works every bit as hard as his predecessors. So he'll have very little time on his hands. Um, with the integrated care, I note that you mentioned the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service there. Are you uh, convinced or content that enough work has been done um, to uh, give the necessary medical information over on a patient and have they enough access to that when they're actually called out, as there is a certain level of care needed? for specific conditions that um, sometimes the ambulance service are not fully aware of? A uh, very interesting point that the honourable member for Lagan Valley has raised, uh, and one in my five years, two months and six days of the, the health committee I haven't heard mentioned before. Could I suggest that the best way forward in this, if he has specific concerns, that he, he contacts my dairy sec secretary and we meet to discuss this issue, because I think it's absolutely vital that ambulance service staff have the full information available. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, these staff are under incredible pressure with an increase of 5% per annum. But I think it's important that, that if they're uh, collecting a patient, that they have the full information required to deal with that patient. But remember, these men and women deal with some of the most horrific and difficult circumstances that any of us could ever face. Uh, and we need to make certain that when they're in an emergency, they have the full information. So I'd welcome that opportunity to discuss that with them. Patsy McGlow. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I guess we have slash and Ira Kamai, and I'm not going to ask him to respond about Port and Mona. The, um, um, but if I, if, I, if I could ask the Minister, uh, what impact has the failure of implementation of the Transforming Your Care Plan had on these integrated care partnerships? I mean, I, I think the Honourable Member from Ulster has got it totally wrong. Trans we are still committed. I'm committed to, to transforming your care, as indeed was the majority of this assembly when it was discussed on numerous occasions, including himself, and that John Compton's analysis is accurate. Now, it's, it's proving difficult in the present financial situation to deliver all of what we'd want as quickly as possible. But what Compton said is that if we do not change the way we're doing things, by 2020 we will not be able to afford an adequate health service, that there are far too many people too far up the ladder of health care provision in Northern Ireland, and we need to give them the support that they're treated at the right level commensurate with their needs. So the, the, the partnerships are continuing. Uh, we, it's, it's, it's going to take three to five years to complete that, and that remains our ambition. However, the financial pressures that we're facing today were not evident when TYC was, uh, was published, and we have to be mindful, mindful of the potential impact that it could have on the scope and scale of change that may be possible. We are going through the very difficult transition period between the publication of Transforming Your Care and its final fruition. The difficulty is while this is all going on, demand continues to rise and also budgets continue to be flatlined or go down in real terms. And that is a challenge. And I said this morning about uh, paediatric congenital heart disease being in my top five. This is also in my top five of issues that we're going to have to deal with. The good news is, is that I ate, slank and drank transforming your care. It came in during my time as chair of the committee. I've had many meetings with John Compton and Fanula McAndrew and other senior staff about this, and I expect there'll be many more to come. But we will continue to give this an absolute priority. Well, Ms. Judith Cochran. Question five, please. Um, could I thank the honourable member for this question? I think it's very appropriate and timely. Uh, currently, all patients across Northern Ireland have access to GP, uh, GPs during working hours, which are defined as 8 a.m. to 6.30 p.m., five days a week, supplemented by seven days' access to the GP out of our service. I am keen to explore how greater flexibility can be provided for patients to access GP surgeries. And I already have written to uh, Mr. Tom, Dr. Tom Black. Uh, and I've arranged a meeting with him on the 23rd of October. Mr Tom Black, of course, is chair of the BMA as Northern Ireland General Practitioners Committee. Uh, I'm meeting him on the 23rd of October to explore this and other issues with him. However, any final decision would have to take account of the significant workforce and financial implications this would give rise to and the consequential additional pressures this would place on the health service budget. Order. Time is up for listed questions. We we'll now move on to topical questions. Mr. Paul Given is not in his place. 
I call Mrs. Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the. Um, I'd like to congratulate the minister on his well-deserved elevation. Can the minister tell me what preparations are being made to deal with possible Ebola in Northern Ireland? Um, again, a very timely and topical question, and I thank the honourable lady for that. Um, in order to deal with the potential importation of a case of Ebola uh, disease in Northern Ireland, my officials have been working closely with our counterparts across the rest of the UK and the Republic of Ireland. The Public Health Agency is responsible for protecting the public from communicable diseases in Northern Ireland. The PHD has been coordinating with regional planning in conjunction with the Department and, of course, the, the Five Trusts. The planning has included the development of patient care pathways by all trusts, preparation for the management and isolation of suspected cases, the accumulation of appropriate personal protection equipment and the carrying out of staff training. In addition, the Chief Medical Officer has sent five letters to the Chief Executives of the Health and Social Care uh, Organisations providing information for all frontline clinical staff who may be treating or admitting patients all infection prevention and control staff and, of course, GPs and practice staff. The letter includes flow charts for use by staff in emergency departments and by staff in primary care for dealing with patients who present with Ebola-like symptoms. The Chief Medical Officer has also written to all schools, universities and further education establishments. It is important to note that the UK has robust systems in place already for infectious disease control, including at airports and ports. Advice by the UK Border Agency has been circulated to all United Kingdom ports. In Northern Ireland, the Public Health Agency, through its Health Protection Service, has communicated with colleagues covering all seaports and airports in Northern Ireland, informing them of the current situation and directing them to sources of other information. In order to reduce the risk of international spread of the disease and in line with the World Health Organization guidance, the affected countries have introduced exit screening at airports to ensure that individuals who are on well do not board flights. Zeal for supplementary. I'd like to thank the Minister for his very informative answer. And can the Minister tell us how many UK health professionals he estimates are, over are overseas caring for Ebola patients? Yeah. Um, yesterday I had a call from the Junior Minister for Health in London who brought me up to date with the situation on a UK-wide basis. And as I'm sure she's aware an exercise was carried out on Friday to, in readiness for the potential for Ebola to arrive uh, in the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, at the point, we believe there's a small number of UK health workers who are caring for Ebola patients in West Africa. Indeed, the minister quoted a figure to me yesterday of about 600. Now, that would indicate that there could be at least maybe 15, 18, 20 of those from Northern Ireland. Indeed, given the, the history of Northern Ireland people in helping uh, those in need in the third world, it might be more. But that gives you an indication of the, the numbers uh, that could be involved. In recognition that some staff may wish to volunteer to work in the affected areas, the UK Chief Medical Officer has recently issued advice to healthcare workers, advising them to register with the UK International Emergency Medical Register. This will enable an appropriate mix of staff to be selected and trained with arrangements to follow up and monitor them on the return. As I've mentioned to you, that we reckon that, we, that it's about 600 frontline staff, uh, and, they're, and mainly in, in, in countries like Sierra Leone, which of course, being part of the Commonwealth, has strong UK links. Uh, could I say that you know, this is an absolute priority, the monitoring of this terrible disease, which has killed over 4,000 people in West Africa. And whilst the ways of contamination are very specific, it's quite clear that already we've seen healthcare workers who've returned from Liberia, Sierra Leone, Nigeria and other affected areas are becoming infected. So therefore we have to do absolutely everything to ensure that this condition does not spread. But remember, the vast majority of people coming from West Africa come through airports in either London or Dublin. And that's where controls have to be effectively exercised to ensure when they then move on to Northern Ireland, they have already been screened for this, this dreadful condition. Mr. Jerry Kelly for a topical question. Uh, last one, Corley. And following on from your uh, ministerial statement to the Assembly this morning, would the Minister uh, uh, tell us the purpose of a public consultation if you have already uh, decided uh, the way forward in terms of uh, children's uh, um, heart uh, services? member for North Belfast has vast experience of the court service and he will understand that when any consultation is carried out, they, they, yes, I think he's a world authority on court services uh, and he's not a barrister, but what I would say is that with any consultation 
uh, that to, in order to, to do things in, in a legal way, you have to have a, a, a period where people can reflect. Now, I have published on the website, the department's website this morning, the full report, unabridged, it's all there. Now, I have read it, officials have read it, and we believe that what it's recommending is the best way forward for very critically ill children. But there may be some observation during the consultation which may be important. We don't know. So therefore, legally, I think we're duty bound. But of course, we can make preparations during the period uh, of the consultation. And then if the consultation comes back, basically giving it a, a full bill of health, we can move on. But I still remain open minded. But I could have to say, Mr. Kelly, my priority is how we deal with some of the terribly ill children I've seen over this last three or four weeks. It all has, frankly, it has broken my heart to sit in rooms and see how ill these children are. I have no party political baggage in this. I'll do what's best for those children. And if the best place for those children to be treated is Dublin, so be it. There can be no boundaries or no difficulties with that. We owe it to these children and are, if needs be, to Birmingham or London. But equally, there will be people in the Irish Republic for the best care and other conditions is here. And that's sensible cooperation between two self-governing jurisdictions. Mr Kelly, for supplement. I thank the Minister for the answer up to now and, and of course agree with him that we need the best care for these children involved. But he will understand that there are people worried because of the transition and the, the passover of the uh, services about what uh, from, for instance, uh, January 2015 will remain in Belfast, uh, what services will remain there? Could you explain that? A, a bit like transforming your care, we're going to move into a very difficult transition period between the removal of services from Belfast and a greater uptake of Dublin, and then in 18 months' time, the final uh, service provision with Dublin under a memorandum of understanding. That has to be watched extremely carefully. But remember, Many children from Northern Ireland have already, since January 14, have been down for, for congenital heart surgery in Dublin. And as far as we can see, generally that has worked well. Many patients from Dublin have been sent to either Birmingham or London for surgery there. So therefore, it's, 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 an, it's almost an international arrangement we have. But I regard it as absolutely essential to watch very carefully that the care that none of the care of these very vulnerable children is remotely uh, affected uh, for uh, the, these 18 months. And could I want to make it clear that Belfast will still be a, a, a centre of excellence for cardiology. We're not closing that down, and that was a concern in the consultation period that that might happen. But I am left with four independent reports all telling me the option of Dublin, or ladies of Dublin, is the only way forward, and I would be negligent to ignore that. David McNary for a topical quest. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, apropos the Minister's earlier answer to Mrs Cochrane, will he explain his plans to manage the ageing GP workforce with 25% likely uh, to retire in the next few years? Um, the Honourable Member for Strangford raises a very opposite topical question. I had dinner on Friday night with uh, the leader of a GP surgery in the East London Dairy constituency, and he made exactly the same point. The sad thing is that GP, the GP route is not seen as an attractive one for lo young local doctors. Many of them want to be consultants, many of them want to have career progression at the A&E or the hospital level. And indeed, nothing, nothing surprises me now, but I have seen um, consultants who look like my grandson. You know, they're so young, it's absolutely unbelievable. People becoming consultants at 30, 33, 35, and that's very attractive. But meanwhile, the GP surgeons are telling me they're having great difficulty attracting those same young doctors to work for them. What I can tell you is that the department is carrying out a review of the medical workforce to look at issues like that. And undoubtedly, the shortage of candidates presenting themselves for GP cover, I think, is going to be an absolute priority and something we're going to have to deal with at university level. Of, on top of that, of course, that many of the potential GPs are not here, but they're in Bondi Beach. We're losing 50 uh, trained doctors a year to go to Australia, where they, both the salary and the conditions are much more attractive. And that's having a profound impact on the pool of experienced medical graduates as well. So it's something he's pushing an open door and will have to be dealt with as soon as possible. Well, Mr McNary for supplementary. Okay, I hope we can walk through the door together, uh, Minister because I need to ask you now, having heard what you've said, and, and I appreciate what you've said, what steps are you actually going to take to prevent closures, 
which are likely to happen due to the fact that we don't have GPs. No, I want to accept that the GPs are under incredible pressure and the stats they provided me would show an escalating number of patients. Remember Northern Ireland's population is now 1.826 million. So even that alone is putting pressure on doctors. But there is no indication of any closures. There is indication of very hard pressed staff. Uh, that, that's without doubt. At the hospital level, of course, we've had to curtail, curtail hours in places like Down, Lag and Valley because we couldn't get the middle grade doctors. But he's right to flag this up. We're going to have problems here. And therefore, that's why the review is so timely, that we're, we're actually looking at a, an intensive work on, on our work, an intensive study of our workforce to identify where do we get these uh, GPs in the future. Because certainly, as I go around surgery throughout Northern Ireland, unfortunately, many of them look like my age. Uh, and that's worrying. I would like to see far more uh, uh, you know, spring chickens rather than old roosters, as it were, in surgeries, who, um, who are about to retire and indeed have made the point that if they were given an appropriate package would go in the morning. And that worries me that that attitude, uh, whilst you go to hospitals, you see far more young doctors who are very keen to advance their careers. Mr. Kieran McCarthy for topical questions. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, last night's Belfast Telegraph had headlines, Hospitals Forced to cancel 9,778 operations at the last minute over the past three years. Is the Minister, I know he's only new into the department, but is he not totally embarrassed by those figures? Um, I, I read that article in the Belfast front page article last night. It is a worry. I'd like to dig down just to see where exactly those figures came from, presumably from an FOI request by the, the appropriate journalist. There are often reasons for this. There can be staff illness, there can be a lack of backup. There can be problems with some of our consultants are flying in from other places to do the work. I don't know what the cause of that is, but what I can tell them is that we're going to investigate that story and find out what's happening, and I, we will come back to him on it. I know that my life won't be worth living if I don't answer his question. He's a quite a, a bit of a terrier on this type of issue. He's right to raise it, but the first indication I had of that story was when I opened that copy of the newspaper about 1 a.m. this morning. Mr. McCarthy for something. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. At 1 a.m. in the morning, you, you, you certainly weren't uh, concentrating on your, uh, your reading because if you had been, you would have seen that a shortage of beds, a shortage of beds um, resulted in no operation for 1,734. A shortage of beds. Broken equipment, broken equipment in the hospitals results in no operation for 593 patients. And here we go, staff shortages resulted in no operation for 1,570. Surely this is all contributing to enormous stress by our patients. And I, I acknowledge what the Minister has said. Sorry, but sorry, I, could, could, we, could I remind I, the I, member, I, please, I, that this is question time in the Northern Ireland Assembly, not Saturday morning in Hyde Park Corner. <laughs> I, do, I do implore the Minister to find out and, and go over those, those, those reasons for the, uh, the operations not being performed, because they are... Uh, within the hospital setting. The member will accept that despite the enormous difficulties of the recession, the previous minister invested in 500 more full-time nurses, a 15% increase in consultants, and we're about to appoint 61 health, new health visitors. So the, the gloom and doom that his party and the members to my right painted have not come true. But to go back to my early point, we have had a, a very large increase in demand and a finite supply of experienced staff and facilities. And often that can lead to a situation where the bed is not available because if you have an emergency situation, you tend to be in a position where you have to use that bed rather than some elective procedure. The other problems, of course, is that we no longer can no longer use the route of the private sector to relieve those waiting lists. And that's a huge concern for me. The fact that so many people were expecting to go to places like the, the clinic, the Northwest Clinic, and Kingsbridge to get that type of uh, surgical procedure, that's no longer available because of financial constraints. We are in great difficulty financially in health. We still need an extra £70 million. There is very little, I understand, coming through the pipeline and monitoring rounds. So we have some very difficult decisions to take, and there will be complaints about those decisions and, and what affects people. So that's probably what keeps me awake at one o'clock in the morning, worrying about that. An extra £71 million, pounds, and I think I'd be sleeping very soundly. With enough to do, I can get uh, 
Mr. Austin, for one question. Very grateful, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the, the Health Minister to update the House on the Speak Up and Save a Life campaign? The um, PHA, as you know, have been organising the, and running the Speak Up and Save a Life campaign for organ donation. And that has encouraged people to talk to their family and friends about their organ donation wishes. Could I say that the moment I was appointed chair of the health committee, I immediately uh, registered my organs for donation. They should be good because there isn't a hint of alcohol in any of them. So they're, they're good quality organs. But I also did it because they, a certain radio show at 9 o'clock on a Monday morning to half 10, which will remain nameless, would have asked me that question. This has included the development and production of two TV adverts two radio advertisements, outdoor posters, which I'm sure we've all seen, online advertisements, Northern Ireland branded organ donation leaflets and posters, and of course, an information website. The initial phase of the media campaign ran from the 12th of February until the 31st of March 2014. Uh, the second phase of the campaign began on the 1st of June and will run to the end of this month. Uh, the impact so far has been significant. The Honourable Member, I know, has taken an interest in this. Since the campaign was launched, there have been 23,148 visits to the website. Uh, before the campaign started, there had been 20,826 new residents on the Augur Donor Register. Uh, that's 598,000 in total. Uh, the rep a report that we received on the 30th of September shows that there have been 2,363 new residents on the register for, through the Northern Ireland website. So this is good news. And what, what we really hope will happen is people like myself will voluntarily put their name on the register and we have sufficient organs to ensure that everyone is covered and there's no need for any further legislation. And this is the commitment of the previous minister to try and deliver that. And well done to the 2,363 new people who have registered. They could save somebody's life someday and have to be applauded for that. Our time is up. Before we return to the